Let's just say you're going to go all in on TikTok. Well, clearly you're going to have to be investing a lot in content creation versus if you're going in on all in on LinkedIn on a personal brand perspective, that means that you're going to need to do a lot of thought leadership and writing, but that may be much more cost effective based on your budget than creating a bunch of original video content. So it all depends, you know, on the frequency and the platform you're choosing. So we're going to be talking about go to market strategy. Um, first things first, uh, we know that uh, it's a science. Sorry, it isn't a science. It's a journey, right? At the end of the day, there's going to be uh, wins and learns, not losses, right? So in today's session, we're going to uh, do it a little bit of an overview of all the different aspects of go-to-market strategy to consider. Then I would, of course, recommend that you watch the recording, um, you know, identify any gaps uh, along the way, and you can go back and tweak that. Super quick bio about me because personal branding is super important to uh, you as a founder. I wanted to share a little bit about me as well. So I am a certified brand strategist. I studied uh, design at OCAD and then digital strategy and communications at U of T uh, here in Toronto, Canada. Shout out to any other Canadians that are on here as well. Um, and, uh, and so my agency uh, is called King Street Media. I'm a partner there. Um, and uh, I'm a marketing advisor and brand strategist, as you know, um, uh, for my own consulting practice. Um, as well, I'm the co-founder of a startup called Creator Club, and I'm in Creator Club right now. It's a, it's a podcast uh, studio, and so uh, it makes recording easy. But now about you, <laughs> which is the priority here today. Uh, what problem are you solving? This is important. This is uh, what we're trying to focus on today. Uh, and then when do you need a go-to-market strategy uh, in the first place? Uh, it's not necessarily um, uh, the right time all the time, but of course you need to know when you need a go-to-market strategy. And some of those situations are you're launching a new product in an existing market. Secondly, you're bringing an existing product that you already have to a new market, uh, or you are testing a new product in a new market. So everything's new. Uh, in that, uh, from that perspective. All right. So the biggest question I always like to ask is who are you building for? Um, you won't have a business if you don't have customers, right? So we're going to start by getting clear about um, who you're building this business to serve. And when it comes to identifying your target market, um, target audience, you might have some theories right? The worst thing you can do is say, what do you mean? My product's for everyone. Um, sure, there are many people that can use your product and service from different demographics and boundaries, but uh, it's so important to get specific here because you're going to need to speak to that particular person. You're going to create a community around them, right? The wording on your website and social is going to speak to them and the tone of voice uh, is going to be in their style. Super quick example here of a customer profile. Many of you have seen this before. Um, you know, we have this person here, Adrian, an active millennial. Um, here's how he spends his time. Here's what he likes to do. How does he prefer to communicate? Phone, face-to-face, -face, email. Uh, what tools does he need to do their job? A CRM software, email, for example. Um, how is their job measured? What are their responsibilities? You know, what social networks do they use? What industry? Are they in? How big is that company? How old are they? Um, so there's a lot that you can look at here from uh, an overarching perspective, and I would encourage you to go as specific as uh, possible. All right, the persona canvas. So this is a tool that you can actually use to um, help you to define um, those those people. Um, let's look into this persona canvas. We're gonna we're gonna give. Um, uh, some details here. So this is actually a template that you can download um, from a designer better business dot tools. That's the website. And uh, there's a lot of things you can you can look at in this uh, particular diagram. And what what that includes is things like the name and the role of your person. It's important to give your persona a real name and role because it helps them feel real. If you have a real person, let's say there's someone who is an ideal customer for you, use that exact person, right? Um, okay, the next thing is these outlines here. So it's designed to make it easy for you to draw what your customer looks like. 
Uh, are they happy? Are they are they upset? Are they frustrated? Do they wear certain clothes? You know, if that's relevant to you, try to make that rich picture, right? Uh, nextly, you're going to identify the need. Um, what do they really want? What decisions are they making, right? So the middle, in, in the middle here, number three is the need. Then you're going to look at what are some of the positive things going on in their life, right? You want to identify um, you know, put yourself into their actual role, whether it's their work life or their personal life. Next is opportunity. So what are some positive opportunities that they uh, experience? Uh, what what uh, opportunities do they have at work or uh, personally? What are some of their hopes for the future? This is a good one to be able to chime into hopes. Um, that's something really deep that you can uh, you can utilize. And then the negative trend. So what's going on? What are some of the challenges? Um, what are some of the headaches that they're experiencing? Uh, what are some of the fears, right? So all of these you're going to be able to really build out and, and hopefully you can have some empathy there for your consumer uh, at the end of the day. Okay, um, looking at this, uh, typically when you're going to do something, let's say running a, a Facebook ad, you're going to have uh, demographics, right? Age, gender, you know, sometimes their uh, relationship status, but you need to go a lot more in depth here as well to really get to the root of this and decide how you're going to market. And that includes not just demographics, but psychographics, right? So looking at the psychographics, those are examples of things that, you know, they care about. What do they really do? What are, what are their wants? They want to become, you know, the CEO of a sustainable business, for example. They run 5K every morning. They spend a lot of time on Instagram looking at healthy recipes. They enjoy traveling solo. So all of these things are going to determine how they are thinking, right? And that includes things like their opinions, things they value, very important to branding as well. Okay. Um, what makes up those, those psychographic factors? Again, it's what are they motivated by, right? What are they interested in? What are their beliefs? What are some of the lifestyle choices that they've made? Um, looking into all of this can really help uh, at the end of the day. Uh, okay. Someone uh, someone there just pointed out that they can't see the slides. Uh, can you just confirm that the rest of the people can see the slides? Yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So now that we've chatted a little bit about the personas, let's talk about positioning. Um, I personally like to take a brand first approach. So let's take a dive into um, what that looks like from a positioning perspective. We'll talk about branding uh, after this, but good positioning for your startup will answer these questions. What does your company do for me as a customer? And why does your company exist and how is it different, right? Um, okay. That's a little bit about positioning. Those are the first two questions I recommend you ask. And of course, you're going to want to identify these items to outline the fundamental value prop at the end of the day that your product or service provides to your customer. So what are some of those things that go into positioning? Of course, the first thing we talked about, target customer or the market. Next is the compelling reason to buy. Next after that is the product's placement within an, either the new or the existing category. And then you're gonna look at what is that key benefit that directly addresses that compelling reason to buy. Uh, next, you're gonna think about the primary alternative source, which is like a competitor. It doesn't mean it's the exact same tool. So if you're building an app, it doesn't mean the competitor is an app, but what is also providing that same benefit right now? And then lastly, what is a key difference or point of differentiation? That's so important when it comes to positioning because we're not trying, we're not out here trying to position ourselves the same as, as everyone else. So once you've thought about this, this is not something you're going to be able to complete, you know, immediately on this session, but think deeply about your positioning statement. Okay. Your positioning statement explains who you are, what you offer, who it's for, and why it's important and compelling. So this is a this is just one of many different templates you can use in order to complete that. So for your target market, who, which is their need, 
your brand name, you insert that here, of course, you provide, and then you list what is that main benefit you provide that differentiate your offering from the competitors, right? Because, and that's the reason why your target market should believe your differentiates differentiation statement okay so that's a lot of things but it's for who provides because um an example here again not every brand follows it purpose uh you know exactly but amazon it's for consumers who want to purchase a wide range of products online with quick delivery and th what are they what are they they're a one-stop online shopping site and then they have this additional information here you know amazon uh, sets itself apart from other online retailers with its customer obsession, passion for innovation, and commitment to operational excellence. So those are three of the differentiators at the end of the statement. So that's one example. Another example is from Mural, uh, which is an online collaboration app. So Mural is for organizations who need visual collaboration at scale, right? And then what do they do? They help you bring imagination to work from everywhere with agile and design thinking methodologies, sales and consulting, and research and design all in one platform, okay? And uh, they have this statement here that says, join a growing network of global enterprises, consultancies, schools, nonprofits. So that's the, they're also mentioning the who it's for at the end as well. They're reiterating that. Another format that you can use for positioning is this. Um, so for, who, so you can basically fill this out. Again, I'd recommend going through the recording after taking a screenshot. So you're for this particular target uh, customer who, again, insert their compelling reason to buy. Your product is a what that provides this benefit, unlike primary alternative source, right? Unlike the competitor, you may not say this, of course, in your public communications, but perhaps uh, it's unlike the existing options that are out there without mentioning a brand name, um, your product insert key difference, right? So I know this is a lot, it's a mouthful to read, but it does make sense when you do it in writing. And because there's no point doing this positioning if you're not going to, you know, properly communicate it, um, this is another, uh, you know, screenshot here from the Mars toolkit that explains, you know, a few things that you're actually answering, right, when it comes to positioning communication. So what is it? It's defined by the product. Instead of just saying what the product is, what does it do? That's the benefit is actually sometimes more important than saying uh, what the product is, right? Uh, what does it mean? That's the effect that your product or startup or service has. And then why should I care? That's the motivation, right? That's the motivation for your user to sign up, to buy, to log in, to uh, give it a try. When it comes to com you know positioning yourself with other uh, players in the space and other competitors, I think this is really important to look at. Um, I love to do these diagrams. I recommend, you know, Quality and price are two things you can compare on. There's many, of course, but if you look at, you know, price, so high price at the top, low price at the bottom, and then you look at quality, low quality on one side, high quality on the other side, this is a great way that even if your product or your app or your service or your tool is doing the same thing as many others, it could be the same thing, but cheaper. It could be the same thing, but uh, much higher quality it could be the same thing but it's more accessible and affordable right so uh consider where you kind of you know fit within this and you know someone may say or an investor may say well that sounds a lot like xyz well great maybe it is a lot like xyz but it's significantly more affordable for example so then you're considered you know the down brand so so compare yourself from that perspective and, and now that i've used the word brand again we're going to define brand and go little, do a little bit of a deep dive uh, into uh, branding here. Okay, so a brand, of course, you've all heard it, is a name, term, design, a symbol, or any other feature that distinguishes an organization, uh, app, startup, product from its rivals in the eyes of the customer. Very important here. So when you look at a brand, what actually goes into it, though, 
Very importantly, it's a lot more than what you can see on the surface. It's a lot more than just the visual identity um, or the key messaging, although those are extremely important to get nailed down in the early days. Uh, what else makes up your brand? Your team, your environment, your core values, your vision, right? All of that uh, you know, contributes. And how can you actually get clear and define your brand? So to go deep, I look into this, uh, I often use this diagram, it's called the Brand Soul Canvas by one of my colleagues, uh, Heather Briggs. And it asks a few questions here. So your purpose, why do you exist? Sometimes, you know, this is these are some existential, uh, you know, bigger picture questions you may ask, and it's, it's gonna take a step back from marketing when you're just trying to get active, let's say on social. Um, this is important to ask these bigger picture questions, okay? So where are you going is your big picture vision, right? The message, what are you saying? The niche, who are your people? Yes, other people will use your service and buy your product, but who is your real core, core, core person, right? Value, what is it that you actually offer? What value are you providing? What makes you different? That's the identity, how people identify you. And then the promise, What's the plan for someone who's coming through your, your, your course or your tool or your service or buying your product or using it, right? What do they get out of that? And so how are you going to serve them and provide for them? And at the, in the middle of all of this would be the brand essence, right? Looking into this, um, I've taken uh, quite a few lessons from uh, Prof G. His name is online, uh, Scott Galloway. He, I took his brand strategy certificate program here, certification. And part of this uh, was this tool here that helps you define the extended identity, the core identity, and the brand essence, right? So you start off with your extended identity. That's the public facing aspect of your brand. And sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's a symbol. It could be an organization or an institution or an actual product. And it's important to note that, you know, some some companies and some apps and tools you know people only know the product but others um they know the founder right or maybe there's a celebrity ambassador or endorsement right or maybe they don't think of it as a particular um app or tool but they think of the overarching institution or organization that provides it so think about that that may evolve over time the next is the core identity that's the uh important elements of the brand that you know just fall under the extended identity. So it should be some something that's pretty substantial and timeless. And then lastly is this brand essence. So what does the brand stand for? Answering some of the questions that we talked about earlier, the one thing that should come to mind when we think of the brand, that's that like quick statement or that quick, um, you know, uh, reaction that someone gives when they think about your brand, okay? And this needs to obviously appeal to the, the need that your product specifically answers. Now that we know all of that deep stuff, what does the brand actually look like at the end of the day, right? Only once you're clear, then you can go and begin the design process. But you, know, you may wanna work with a designer, but providing a designer with all of the stuff that we just chatted about from more of a brand strategy approach can help that designer to really accurately um, create something that's going to be unique and representative. So the brand is that overarching perceived, you know, identity. Then you've got the identity, which is the visual aspects that inform your brand. And then you have the logo, which identifies the business in the simplest form. Obviously, we know a lot of examples of this, but the difference between, you know, brand, branding, identity, and logo um, are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're defined here. Um, a lot of times people just mention brand or logo and they, they are referring to the whole thing. When you think about visual identity design as a whole, it plays into, um, it plays into a lot more than, you know, just your um, uh, logo itself, but it's also things like the colors, the fonts, the imagery, the icons. You, we all know that something like an international startup like Airbnb, for example, that icon is Airbnb. It doesn't say Airbnb, but it is, right? Um, same thing with Spotify. If we remove the word Spotify, we know that that is in fact Spotify. So um, this is a really important thing to consider when you're eventually gonna you know, 
eliminate certain aspects of your brand and refine it. But I will say this, do, don't just expect someone to know, um, you know, just from an icon, what your brand is. So at the beginning, you know, you should definitely still consider starting off, including the name. What's funny about that though, is as you start to really solidify your colors and fonts and symbols and icons, people can tell what your brand is, even if you swap out the name. So for these major global brands here, you know, we can tell that even though the names are not there, we know that, you know, this blue one um, under the burger is Gap, for example, right? Or we know that, um, you know, the one in the very right is is Pfizer, right? So um, the word NFT is being used here as a, as a default placement, but you can tell, you know, there's Netflix, there's NASA, there's Corona, right? There's uh, all of these particular uh, well-known brands. And that just shows you that the identity is, uh, is more than just that, you know, initial um, logo. And that's where the style guide comes in. So Right now, if you're, let's just say you're a solo founder, you have a co-founder, you don't have a huge team yet, you might not think it's important to have a brand style guide. But I tell you this, the more um, organizations you partner with, the more people you start working with, collaborating with team members, et cetera, you're gonna, you're gonna need um, a brand guideline that can be applied, whether you're building your product, whether you're doing marketing decks, whether you're doing, you know, again, partnerships, videos, so um, what does that look like from a system perspective? So Uber has this system with nine core elements, for example, on the right-hand side. So it has a logo. It has their colors, which in this case are black, white, and that accent blue. Um, it has composition. It has how the icons work. It has an illustration style. It has a motion style. It has um, photography style. It has a tone of voice. It has typography, right? So all of these are, are elements, you know, that form Uber's a visual identity, for example. And then um, there's a lot more guidelines than this because they're, you know, a massive global startup that has a lot of touch points. However, um, you know, all of this kind of translates into an easy to use visual identity. HubSpot has a template here. Um, it has a brand style guide template that you can use. I'm not going to go through every single component of that, um, but I'm just going to quickly um, skim through some of the things that are in there. So, you know, you know, things that you would put in your guideline for your team to use or partners to use, right? Um, name, purpose, values, brand promise, brand personality, right? Um, the visual foundation is going to include the logo and the spacing requirements, what not, how not to use the logo, how not to modify things. Um, you know, the secondary logo or icon you might have, you know, your full color palette, all of this stuff here, right? So, um, when and why to use certain colors, maybe they represent certain products or certain, um, you know, niche audiences, um, how are you going to be accessible? What fonts are you using? You know, what are the alternatives for web fonts if you have a special font that can't be used elsewhere? So there's all kinds of stuff that you can include. Now, again, you don't have to make this from scratch. By, by all means, you can hire a branding uh, person to do so, but um, you're going to still want to invest in this in order to then make sure that the public identifies your brand with any of those things, right? When they see a certain photo, they see a certain visual element, they know it's your brand, your startup. That's the reason for all of this. So these are just some of those components that are all included in um, this, this like free HubSpot guide. And uh, one of those important aspects is the brand voice, which I think regardless of the situation you're in, um, you know, whether you're writing a blog post, a caption, a landing page, you know, an email, social media, whatever it is, it should be that same um, post. And yes, for everyone asking the slides and the recording will uh, the recording will be made available with all the slides. Yes. Um, okay. So now that you have your brand, what do you do now? Um, you need to, of course, do the marketing. And that's what this session is all about as well. But part those are the things I covered so far, some critical aspects that go into it. Um, so what is a marketing plan? You know, a lot of people throw out the term marketing plan. They cover it in business school. 
uh, even in high school business classes. But really, it's this it's this roadmap to strategically organize, execute, and track your whole marketing strategy over a period of time. Could be a marketing plan for the year. Could be a marketing plan for the quarter. Um, you know, it in, could include very specific marketing strategies uh, for different team members. But they all, all at the end of the day, it's working towards your business goals. Why should you have this marketing plan? It's another thing to add to your to-do list. Well, uh, it's important because it's going to document everything in one place so you can track and measure. If you aren't able to track it and measure it, then you won't know what's working and you'll be wasting you know, time and resources, right? There's this quote here uh, that I'll skip, but at the end of the day, you know, it makes it easier for you to, to stay on track. So when you're writing your, your marketing plan, a super quick um, outline here is starting with the mission, right? Then determine the KPIs for that mission. So, you know, how do you know that it's going to be successful? What, what key performance indicators are you measuring? Identifying your buyer personas, which are the things that we went through at the beginning. Uh, describing your content initiatives and strategies. Um, that's important, especially if you're an online focused brand uh, or startup. Clearly defining your plans, omissions. The reason this, this one is emphasized is because as a startup, you are not doing everything. You're not going to, you know, launch a podcast and a newsletter and a blog and three or four social media platforms and do influencer marketing. You're not going to do it all. So what are you specifically leaving out of that plan and why, right? That's important. Very, very, very important. By content initiatives and strategies, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about that later. Someone just asked. Um, but that just looks like what do you, what are you, what exactly are you going to be putting out into the world for content? Are you creating videos? Are you creating infographics? Are you creating blog posts, articles, guest posts? What does that look like, right? Next is, of course, defining the marketing budget on a, I would recommend doing it on a, a quarterly and annual basis, but, you know, you will need to know, because it might vary from month to month, but at least if you have an average, that's fine, stick with that. Um, you may actually see that it's ramping up over certain quarters as you introduce new, uh, you know, new features, for example, or get more funding, but definitely plan your budget and then identifying your competition very, very important. Uh, don't spend too, too much time on the competition all the time, but definitely spend a lot of time upfront identifying them. This is important. You can't just ignore, you know, what else is out there and what they're up to. Lastly, this marketing plan is not going to happen if you don't outline the um, contributors who's going to do stuff <laughs> in this marketing plan, right? Um, someone made a comment here about not conflating a marketing plan and a marketing strategy. It's true. So your upfront marketing strategy is something that's very valuable. It's going to identify a lot of core principles. However, the marketing plan can change over time, right? And you can do have a marketing plan for different initiatives. You could have a marketing plan, like I said, timely. You have a marketing plan for this quarter, marketing plan for next quarter, but the overarching marketing strategy may remain the same. Um, Part of the, one of the things that comes into marketing plans a lot, one of the ways you can look at it is the four Ps. So we've got, uh, in this case, product, price, place, and promotion. Under product, you're gonna ask, of course, you're gonna answer the question, what do you sell? Uh, next, you're gonna ask, but, but outline all those options, right? All the types, price points, subscription options, everything. Then you're gonna look at your, your price. So how much are you charging? How does your pricing impact how customers view the brand, right? Uh, if you're <clears throat> on that scale, we talked about it, right? We talked about where you fall. Are you the most expensive option? Are you the cheapest option? Are you a midpoint but high quality? Where are you and how does your price determine that? Are you pricing it annually, monthly, one-off fees, right? Place, or are you free, right? Um, place, where are you actually going to promote your product? Uh, where do you, where do the, those customers actually live? Where do they go to find out information about what you offer, right? That's super, super important. Uh, it doesn't matter if at the end of the day, you're not going to have, um, if you're not going to communicate in the right place, your content could be amazing. Um, but yeah, that's important. Okay. And then part of the marketing mix uh, in, is going to be, what will you do in each category? So for promotion, you might do publicity and PR, you might do sales, you might do emails, right? You might run some ads. Um, 
I think I'm going to skip this video here, but I can send it out uh, afterwards uh, just for time purposes. But spend time developing your product and pricing, right? Looking at, you know, what to consider, which channels does your audience use the most to consume information? A lot of times, you know, people start off and just uh, launch 20 different, uh, you know, social media profiles and accounts and blogs and directories. But where are those customers first? Where is that target customer spending most of their time? What kind of message tends to work with them? Is it is it like a high pressure, like if you don't do this, you're going to have a problem? Is it a fear-based thing, right? Or is it something more like here's how to optimize and prevent issues? Um, here's how to perform better. Is it a message that's going to be about, you know, sales and incentives? Um, what type of message actually works with your type of, of product or service, right? And then what is the ideal period for promoting your product? Does that mean you're going to be promoting, you know, all the time? Is it a three month buying cycle because you're selling to businesses that need long time to make decisions? Or is it something where, you know, it's a very short marketing cycle where someone needs to see your ad three times and they're in, right? Over the course of a, a week um, or instantaneously. So think of that, that's a major factor. Is there any concern about seasonality? Do you have a product or a business that, you know, is affected by certain things like holidays or annual initiatives or it's used during a certain time of the year? Um, think about that as well and when you will promote. And then lastly, how do your competitors promote? Super, super, super uh, important to consider. What does promotion look like? I obviously you know, recommend organic and paid. I'm going to speak a little bit about that later as well, but I think you should have a balance of both. I've made a massive list here of just a bunch of, this is not even a massive list. There's, there's a lot more out there, of course, but things like SEO, ads, newsletters, sponsored content, affiliate marketing, partnerships, LinkedIn outreach. There's a lot you can consider, right? Depending on where your actual um, customers are and uh, what your budgets are and what stage you're at. But definitely realize that there's a wide range. Some are paid, some are not. And don't just fall into the trap of, oh, yeah, we're going to start running some Instagram ads, right? It's not just that. Um, that might not be the best thing for your particular brand, right? And again, because, of course, I work in marketing, I know the resources involved. And so until you've grown enough to hire marketing staff or an agency, most important thing out of all this is be where your customers are most as a founder, as a team member, you know, be there, spend time there. If they're, if it's B2B and they're talking on LinkedIn, get in some LinkedIn groups, get in some LinkedIn conversations, see what people are saying, spend time interacting there and posting there because you can't be everywhere at once, but you can go deep in, in the areas that matter the most. And then later on, you can build and add to those platforms, right? It's the number one mistake I see founders make is try to be everywhere all at once and they stretch themselves too thin and then it suffers. Look at the usage uh, data and trends and give a couple of platforms a fair shot, like I said, okay? So a couple best practices here. Um, one is called the rule of one and three. So what is the rule of one and three? I didn't invent it, of course, but the idea is to focus on one differentiator and at the most three unique value propositions for your product, right? There's a lot of products out there. People can't remember everything. So what do you want them to remember? I would say own in on one thing that you want them to remember you for. Um, Apple iPhone versus Google Pixel is a classic example, right? I've always been, uh, I'll say it here, I'm, I'm an iPhone user. I've always been an iPhone user uh, from as soon as they were available. But um, when Google launched a Pixel, uh, you know, they highlighted a lot of differentiators, right? Like they gave all kinds of stats and figures and data points and things like the weight and the materials and all of this, right? But Apple focused on one thing with the phone initially at this stage, right? Not just at the beginning, but during this particular campaign, they focused on the camera. They ran these ad campaigns, which you may have seen in your city. I know I've seen some in Toronto. I've seen some in traveling in other cities as well, shot on iPhone to remind people that when it comes to taking, you know, photos and videos, you can't beat iPhone. Now, of course, there, you could argue there are some better cameras out there than iPhone, but 
at the time and at certain points in time, this was one thing they decided to um, focus on to differentiate themselves, right? So what is that one thing that you can do better than anyone else? Um, think of that. Another thing that I kind of touched on is looking at organic before paid. So perhaps starting with organic, uh, and that, that includes some outreach, of course. It doesn't include just posting to a, a social media account with zero followers, right? But thinking of some organic methods and then amplifying that with paid, right? When you're building out your assets, uh, what can you start with? Organic could look like social, it could look like a blog, could look like, you know, something that you're building yourself, some content, YouTube series, podcast, whatever it is, that really highlights your product. How does it work? What does it do? What are the differentiators, right? What are some of those benefits? And that basis point will be something that you can use for your the rest of your marketing. So let's say you go all in on a newsletter or all in on a blog. A lot of people are using Beehive to like build a newsletter community, for example. Um, there's a lot of other um, tools you can use as well. Then from there, you can streamline that into your other assets, your other your other social. The example I have up here, this uh, I got from a, a great video that talked about this as well, was um, when Ally Bank launched. They focus on offering a really great savings rate. They announced it on their organic social. And then later on, they followed up with paid. But their message became consistent across all their assets. So you can start with that one really well-written thing. And your the rest of your assets will be easy to create. Another thing, uh, my third, uh, the third tip, third best practice here, sorry, is to prioritize clarity over complexity. Um, be the best at explaining, you know, what your industry is, what the problem is, and what you do. And from this perspective, people will want to learn from you, right? When people learn from you, they trust, they build trust with you, and they want to eventually become a customer. I've listened to, you know, podcasts and resources and blogs from services that I subscribe to, something like, for example, FreshBooks, um, you know, an accounting software, or uh, or HubSpot. They put out tons of resources and guides, and I'm building. Uh, trust and, and positive affiliations with this brand. So at the end of the day, yes, I end up buying with them, uh, buying and, and becoming a, a customer, right? Um, this example is is called Liftoff. Um, they they put out a bunch of blogs and videos to educate the market when uh, Apple was going to change, uh, when they changed the rules in the operating system. And so they explained all these complex concepts in a simple, easy to use way with visuals and analogies and things like that. So that people who are marketing, you know, on, on mobile phones and, 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 and apps and things like this and running ads, um, they could see lift off the brand as a leader. So if you're seen as a teacher and, and breaking things down for your industry, I think that's uh, important. Okay. When it comes to launching, because of course it is about going to market, um, there's a few things I would that I would say is to share as you go, right? Document the process, document the journey. There's a lot right now that's really expanding. Even since I did this presentation last year, around the same time, was is, is something called founder-led marketing, and it's and it's growing. People want to see the process. They want to follow the story. They want to follow the journey. So build that hype, right? Now, how do you actually utilize that or capitalize on that? At the end of the day, you can um, uh, offer some early bird or exclusive incentives. You could do a beta or a testing phase that's exclusive or that you invite people to. Um, you can offer subscriptions or uh, other trials. For example, you could do crowdfunding, soft launch, you can generate a wait list, but let people know what's happening and give them an opportunity to engage. Okay, just uh, just checking checking on the chat super quickly. There's a lot of uh, questions that have rolled in as well, so I will uh, I will address those as well soon. So the customer journey um, helps you get insight into track and discuss how a customer experiences a problem you're trying to solve. Now, if you're not sure how to go to market or how to market in the first place. Looking at this act where the customer is and when they're identifying the problem that you're solving will really, really help you to speak to them and to find where to market and when to market. So, for example, how does this problem or opportunity show up in their lives? 
How do they experience the problem? How do you, how do they interact with you, right? Are they like frantically Googling a solution to something and they come across your site and they're all stressed out? Um, are they asked by someone at work to go find solutions and they turn to a directory and they go through all the options? You know, when does that problem show up or what is that opportunity they're looking for? Um, you know, think deeply into this that customer journey is gonna is gonna give you the insight. So uh, think from the customer's perspective, right? Their goal in life is not to buy your product or use your service. Usually your product is gonna be a means to an end, right? They're trying to get something from it. So what end is that? Um, how do they experience the problem that you're trying to solve? And uh, what do they currently do to solve that problem? How do they currently deal with it, right? While you're defining these moments for the customer, try to place them in some kind of order and you can kind of map this out, right? Find these moments in a customer's day um, where they these touch points where your product or service can come into the picture. Again, it comes to putting yourself in the mindset. An easy way to do that is um, thinking of, you know, what led to that moment. For example, um, what happened first? Then what does the customer think or feel? And then they've identified that, that need um, that need that comes in, right? So this is uh, an example. This is a the journey uh, canvas, customer journey canvas from that same source I mentioned earlier, designabetterbusiness.com. And uh, you can you can map that process out. Think about how you can map out the customer journey. Um, you already have the persona at this point. Second thing you're going to think about is all these touch points. How are they interacting? How could you interact with the customer? You know, in store, online, webinar, phone, email, contacts, ads, um, mood. What is the customer's mood at the very moment? Are they happy, angry, frustrated, right? Um, number four, timeline and stages. Define at least five moments in the journey <clears throat> when you're mapping it out on this uh, chart over here. That's why there's, you know, these different columns here, right? Um, what period of time, like, is this over a three month period? Is it over a one week period? Is it one day, right? What's that step-by-step -step experience like? And, uh, and actually ask people, right? You don't have to make it all up from scratch. And lastly is the customer need. So, um, what's the job that the customer wants to get done in each of those stages? For example, if your customer is looking to identify the company that, that they want to work with, or actually looking for the, to hire someone in this point, uh, we want to understand what those touch points are and what questions they ask at each of those moments. Okay. So this is just the customer journey canvas that you can use. And of course, this wouldn't be, you know, a marketing um, uh, presentation if we didn't dive into, you know, the customer journey process, right? So taking someone from awareness to um, considering your service or your app or your tool, or your product, right? to then them making an actual decision, which is the actual sales you know, portion, to onboarding them. Hopefully they have a successful experience and they may or may not need support. And then long-term adoption and retention, right? Uh, unless it's just a one-time thing, you do wanna be able to um, actually have that long-term relationship. So awareness to consideration, decision, onboarding, adoption, retention, Looking at that process, it includes everything from, you know, marketing to sales to customer experience. I'm going to skip uh, these two examples here. Well, the, B, the B2B example I'll mention because, you know, people go through a whirlwind sometimes, right? <laughs> and your app or your tool may be the solution to end this, but, um, you know, they start off uh, looking for a solution that they need, right? Maybe it's a new accounting app. Maybe it's an app to organize their content, whatever it is. They're having a hard time comparing options. They're going to research those. Then they finally feel good about it and they, you know, decide to sign a contract or sign on. Uh, but then they went through the onboarding process and they didn't realize some things weren't included or they didn't realize they can't add their team to it, for example. Um, then they figured that out. You help them with that through content, through support, through whatever it was. Um, then when they're using it, right? How are they feeling? Oh, they're feeling this, this is helping their business and their team. Great. Um, that means they're more likely to recommend it to someone else. They needed support. Awesome. The support went well. They're going to want to also recommend it and keep using it. And then when it comes to renewal, 
if, whether it's a subscription or they're deciding to you know audit their their vendors um they can make that decision based on the all the ups and downs that they went through in this process right so this is just an example um which is important now none of your go-to-market strategy uh works if you don't have product market fit of course uh, and so this quote here from Dave, Dave Wang, uh, I think is important to, to mention. The secret to finding market fit is about maximizing the number of product iterations with the limited resources you have. The deeper you know about your customers, the closer you are to finding product market fit. Because you don't have an unlimited budget and unlimited time, um, that's important to, to consider. And so... Uh, what we have here is uh, a diagram to figure out where are where is your solution in this journey. So this guy Dave, that I just quoted, he he goes by Product Dave, and he has this this diagram, for example. So there's your product journey: idea, idea, validate, planning, design, develop, launch, finding market fit, maintaining saturation, then deciding to keep it, kill it, or restart. Um, you know. It is a stage and it is a process and it's iterative. So you can go through this cycle. Um, but there's a lot that you do, of course, before you're fully out there, before you have market adoption, right? And that's why it's important to find that product market fit as early as possible and iterate. This is a six-step uh, process to find your uh, fit at the end of the day. And um, it, it starts off with lining up your product goals first, right? Right. So is it unlimited, you know, user signups? Is it high revenue growth? Is it having the biggest market share? Is that your first goal? Is that the goal for your product? Number two, come up with a product hypothesis. This could be this again, just like a product initiative, product idea, something that you want your product to do and, and solve. Number three, you're going to uh, prioritize the product hypothesis by discussing with your team, selecting which ones you're actually going to get customer feedback on because there's multiple ways you can approach it, right? Which ones are you going to actually try and get customer feedback on? Step four is getting feedback from five customers on the product hypothesis. This should give you a good indication of whether the idea is worth pursuing further or not, right? So use a mix of customer insights, which are going to be qualitative, data and customer behaviors, which is quantitative data where you can you know, count those by numbers. Uh, next, number five is make small bets with MVP. So test out you know, parts of your product or tool or service. Uh, and then lastly, evaluate market traction, see how it's actually doing. And that's where you decide to you know, keep it, kill it or pivot. That's the, the phrase that um, he comes up with. So in the middle of this diagram, you see this Overlap. Product market fit is when you have the product solving a problem for many customers and uh, there's a strong market with critical mass of customers. There's enough customers. So that's in the middle where you have product market fit. It's a lot. Obviously, there's a ton to do. I'm going to spend some time um, answering some questions. Just want you to I just want to acknowledge, of course, that marketing and testing and iteration is so important. Um, I have this uh, this uh, go to market checklist for launching a product that is by a company called Viral Loops, which um, again I can include the link to. Um, and there's three steps here. There's three um, kind of stages. Again, um, it's 44 essential product launch tasks, basically divided into three phases. So every time you complete one of these, you can change its status. You can just you know list them out. This is not like a definitive 44. It's not like I've come up with the, the only 44. It's not like this company, Viral Loops, made the only 44 tasks. But if you're launching a product and you're going to market with it, um, you know these are some things to, uh, to look into. So in the, in the pre-launch phase here, there's uh, 29 tasks. Things like market research for you, for your target audience, your competitors, creating your marketing plan that we just talked about, developing your launch strategy, and setting goals and objectives to make sure you're heading in the right direction. So that's this phase. The second phase here is the actual launch phase, and there's six tasks. These are all about actually launching the product and implementing your marketing, sales, and customer support plans. 
And then there's the post launch, which is important. There's nine tasks here to gather customer feedback, set up things like referrals for so you can grow, promote your product and measure the results. Overall though, this checklist is there to help you set a clear roadmap um, and so that you, you, you have data, right? So this is very important to, to consider. And there's another tool here called the Go-To-Market Canvas that was developed by someone else who did a workshop, I believe a while back with Founders Institute. It's a free template uh, that she has uh, where you can kind of put everything in one place. Uh, you can use, you could write this anywhere. You can do it on a whiteboard. You can do it in a Google Slides doc. You can do it in Figma, anything you want, but just you know somewhere to put a lot of these components that make up a go-to-market strategy. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer some questions quickly, and then if we have extra time, I'll, I'll go back to a couple slides. But first question I'm seeing here uh, is, does this approach with Persona Canvas work in B2B, um, and how can you adjust it? Yes. Last, It's funny. In the last workshop I did, I actually answered a question about this same thing. So... Um, in B2B, you have two customers, right? You have the actual company and what's the use case for that business for them to use you, but you also have the person who's the decision maker and or sometimes the person who's researching those options, right? So you're gonna have to speak to two people. What are the needs of that person who's doing the research to source the vendors, to source the products that can help them? And then who's actually deciding? If you focus on the person who's looking, you wanna make it easy for them to identify quickly that this is a fit, right? If you're speaking to the end buyer, you may be speaking about different benefits such as you know, price points and renewals and contracts and things like this. Um, but if you're speaking to the person who's actually making and making the decision, um, how are you going to really drive home those benefits that, can, that, that help you um, compete and win compared to the other options. If you're speaking to the buyer though, you got to be super search friendly and you got to answer those, those high level questions to confirm that yes, this is the general direction, the general category, and you want to make them look good. You want to make their job easier. So what are their concerns? They need to look good. They need to be organized. They need to be able to differentiate you quickly. They need to find you easily. Right. Um, and so I would create a persona for them and I would create a persona for the end decision maker in the company as well. Awesome. Okay. Another question we have here are, um, how do you launch a paid version of your current free product? This is a great question. I think what's important about this is that you need to really, really, really focus on the benefits of the premium features that are available, right? What pain point is your current product solving? And then does it solve it better with the paid version? Does it solve a different related problem, right? Like what is the paid version actually doing that enhances that? And that's where, you know, you can really point out the those additional pain points that it solves. And um, how do you actually launch it? You, you go ahead and communicate those benefits and you continuously remind people based on usage. So if you have a way of categorizing people, let's just say that, you know, you have a video app and it allows you to record 10 minutes, but for premium users, you can record, you know, 30 minutes. Well, great. If you are noticing that your users are often reaching, you know, the 10 minute mark, promote to those users, promote that to those users if you have that data, the extension of the time, right? Um, that's just one very, very basic example, but you can target, um, you know, the paid features to certain users. Okay, awesome. Regarding a personal brand or personal advisory and coaching, does uh, personality or style of consulting count as USP? Yes, it does. I think that when you are selling a service like consulting or coaching, you are the product. So you can sell two things, right? You can sell your approach and your process that that people typically tend to buy. So if you're a strategist, you have a framework or a process. Some of the frameworks I showed today are ones, for example, that I may leverage. But you're also selling your unique personality and approach and people buy from people. And part of that is trust. 
And it's important that you can show your personality and style so that your, your buyer um, can actually confirm that, yes, this person is for me. I can, I can get along with them. They understand my thinking. They may be able to relate to you know, the problems that I'm facing. And uh, so it is important to show your, you know, your personality and your style in there. That's important. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me just, there's quite a few questions here. So I'm just going to, uh, just going to check some more things here. Uh, do you recommend an affiliate or partner program for a beta launch for a D to C SaaS? <clears throat> okay. And if so, do you recommend a specific platform or pricing strategy? So in the beta program, um, I think that you're, you're really got to focus on usage use cases, what's working, what's not working. And, uh, the pain points that you're solving and what is that customer feedback like because it's direct to consumer um you know you may find that people are, are using the product differently i think that you need to find and prove retention before you start offering an affiliate or partner program um that that being said if you already are launching to an existing audience or if you have a partner app or tool or community that knows this is perfect for them uh, it doesn't hurt to to start off by developing a, a you know a partner program so that they can sell it to their audience. Some of the best you know launches come out because they, it's prepared with an ambassador, let's say, right? But it's a risk, of course, if you haven't really done uh, you know a lot of trials. I guess in your alpha phase, if you have a lot of great feedback and everything's working smoothly, amazing. The reason I would wait a little bit longer is because sometimes you don't know the specific benefit points that you're solving for or uh, the ways people are using your 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 SaaS product um, more or less of that might differ in the way that you position it. So I would wait a little bit more on for the affiliate uh, our partner program. OK, <clears throat> awesome. Uh, let's see what other questions here. OK, how do I recommend so from Greg, how do I recommend allocating budget uh, time or money? across positioning, branding, planning, content, uh, and analysis. Okay. So it depends, of course, what stage you're at. But uh, so Greg is asking, sorry, let me just. Uh, okay. How do you recommend allocating time budget across positioning, branding, planning, content creation, analysis? So this is one of the reasons why I mentioned to go in, go all in with one platform first. That one platform is going to uh, really help you to um, uh, streamline your budget, right? So let's just say you're going to go all in on TikTok. Well, clearly you're going to have to be investing a lot in content creation versus if you're going in on all in on LinkedIn on a personal brand perspective, that means that you're going to need to do a lot of thought leadership and writing, but that may be much more cost effective based on your budget than creating a bunch of original video content. So it all depends, you know, on the frequency and the platform you're choosing. Um, but upfront, so important to not invest in any of the marketing and ongoing um, aspects if you haven't already fully invested in your positioning and branding first. That's so important because it means that your, your content is going to be way less effective. It's not going to hit your audience um, uh, as effectively. And so it's kind of a waste of your time if you're not investing upfront. So I would recommend you know, you get that nailed down first. You're still going to adjust it and pivot, of course, but get your positioning and your branding first uh, and your strategy and then focus on the content and analyzing it and, and adjusting from there. Thank you, Greg. Um, right. Daniel, thank you for, uh, for, uh, for all the beautiful answers, but I guess we cannot have a lot of the, <laughs> the questions because we're running out of time, unfortunately. But um, yeah, thank you very much for the amazing presentation, the insights. Everyone is asking about the presentation. Don't worry, we will send you a follow-up email uh, in the next 24, uh, uh, 48 hours. So um, uh, I, we do have a networking lounge. I don't know if Daniel, can you uh, dedicate like 30 minutes or something for the networking lounge? Maybe people want to talk to you in person and so on. So, yep. I uh, I can spend a few minutes in the networking lounge. Yeah. Great. You have a table with your name. So 
use the networking lounge to talk and network and ask more questions to Daniel. Um, thank you very much. This was as good as the next one, even better, I believe. So um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. See you. See you in the networking lounge, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. No problem. I'll be happy to chat with you there.